still morning, whether you were gathered or you were going to watch this up the road a little bit. This is our faith series, and we're talking about different places, how faith shows up, where faith shows up. And for December, it's about faith in the darkness. So Kate and Andrew, thank you for being willing to be here and share your story about um, where you've encountered faith in the darkness. Thank you. So like Leah said, I'm Kate, this is Andrew Bush. Um, we've been married 21 years. <laughs> <laughs> Just to look at me. <laughs> That's a flip of the script right there. There's faith in darkness. <laughs> so um, we have four kids between the two of us. He has an older daughter that's 25. She was four, I think, when we got married. Um, and then we have Ava and Noah and Grayson. Ava's 19, Noah's 15, and Grayson is 11. And so what we're going to talk about is being the parent of special needs children. Right. Um, primarily Grayson, our 11-year-old, he um, is diagnosed with autism and epilepsy and sensory processing disorder, um, ADHD. Anything else? Just OCD. Obsessive compulsive. Yeah. Um, so for us, traveling way back in time, he pretty much for the most part, typical baby. And I distinctly remember thinking to myself when I was pregnant, like third baby, like this is going to be a breeze. <laughs> like, you know, we've got it down. We've had, we had his daughter, we had our other two. And it was like, this is going to be so great. And about the time he was a year and a half old, um, well, at a year we had moved back here to Silverton from Salem. And about a year and a half, I kind of started noticing, you know, every night I would rock him to sleep, I would sing him songs. And it occurred to me that he wasn't talking. He wasn't making any sounds. And I thought it was weird. And, you know, they always say, oh, we'll check their hearing. So I would do that. He'd be playing on the playroom floor, and I'd come up behind him and make noises and whatever. And, and he would always turn, so I knew he, he heard me. But he didn't, you know, play with trucks and vroom vroom or trains, and there was no noises. And he, he was doing like a mama or dada, a little bit of that. Um, but it got to where he was getting older, like a year and a half, two years, and he had a total of five sounds. There was ma, da, and then I don't, I don't remember. There was ba, and that was banana, because um, he loves bananas. And he had like two other sounds that he would make. And it turned into a lot of, like if he wanted something, there was just noise. He would make a noise, he would kind of yell. Um, and I think for us, we kind of got used to that. And we would go to his doctor, like regular checkups, and his answer was, well, my daughter didn't talk till she was four. Don't worry about it. You know, some kids just develop later. And pretty much Ava, as a baby, had developed super fast, super early. Noah lagged behind in a few things, which was very typical for a boy. Um, and Grayson reminded me much more of Ava in that he was very advanced with his development except for the talking. And so we just kind of didn't think much of it. And we, um, at the time I worked at Salem Hospital, working a lot of hours. Um, it was always more than 40 hours a week. And that was hard, especially when we started having these issues coming up that we didn't know what was really going on with him. He started um, randomly getting sick, like, He'd spike a fever of 103, he'd throw up, and then he'd sleep for four hours and wake up perfectly fine, all of it gone. And it was more, you know, and it happens over time, so it was like, well, that was weird, you know. And then a month later, it would happen again. Right, and the build up to those throw ups, he would get really violent with his brother and family members. Yeah. He, because he couldn't express what he wanted to say, he would get angry and, 
and there was those types of things that you're like, well, this isn't. And and when he would have these really big meltdowns like that, then you could kind of correlate with that with okay, he's gonna have, he's gonna start throwing up, he's gonna. But we didn't we didn't correlate it at the time. No, no. But looking back, you can correlate. Okay, yeah. so these were the connection points, and then he would he would throw up, and then he would be. How so old was it when he was? When probably he started, two. About two, two and a half. About so he two. Was yeah, yeah, he was, everything was normal except the speech just wasn't there. So, and like you say, that's all hindsight. Like, we didn't put any of that together at the time. Right. But it got to where we felt like something was going on. We bring up to his doctor and it was like, oh, he's getting a bug. Kids get bugs. You know, he... Keep, keep a food journal, see what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, maybe is. something's bothering his tummy. And yeah. it was like, okay. And at the time, we had a gal in her home that was babysitting him when I would work. And she had gotten to the point where all her, she had four boys and they were all in school. So she was going to stop taking care of kids. So we started, um, we found a daycare here in town and we started him there. And um, he was there three days and she said, we cannot keep him. And every day there was something that had happened. And he had like kicked a woman in the face and given her a black eye. And these meltdowns were just getting like out of control. And it was, what are we gonna do? What is happening? Um, and it, when I say meltdown, like every kid, you know, they have a tantrum, they throw themselves on the floor in the grocery store. They, these would go on for an hour. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't work himself out of it or exhaust himself. It would just go on and on and on. And he was, he started to get violent, like two and a half, three years old, where I couldn't hug him without him grabbing my arms and just, or biting me really badly, breaking the skin. Um, I got to the point where that was hard because I really got to the point inside where I was like, I don't even like my kid anymore. He's a nightmare. Like, and he would go back and forth between, and you know, being super loving and then doing things like that to where, you know, every time he'd come and hug me, I'd like cringe and back away because he would come up and hug me and then bite me in the stomach. And it was like, I just, and you hate yourself as a parent too, right. because you're like, what kind of parent am I that I'm absolutely not liking my child right now? Like I can't even be around him. It was horrible. And this daycare he was at, he was there, like I said, the three days and I was like, I don't understand what's going on because at Amy's house, he was great. He was fine. And she said, and of course, as a parent, you get your hackles up about that too. Like, what's, what are you saying about my kid? I'm not my kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the best thing she did too is she was like, I just want you to come in one day and see him with the other kids. She said, I just want you to see him. And we did. And that was the best thing she could have done because I think, like I said, we had gotten so used to him being the way he was in our little family, seeing him with those other kids, his, his age, excuse me, it was, you know, besides the not talking and not verbalizing. And by this point, he's like three, you know, every little thing, like these other kids are running around and they're talking and they're playing and he wants to be part of that, but he can't make it known. So his answer is violence with everything. And it was, it was a very big disparity in maturity, you could see as well. And she said, my mom works for Willamette ESD. She said, I want you to call Willamette ESD and ask for an evaluation. She said, there's something that's not developmentally correct. And like I said, being there, you could, it was like, okay, take a breath. I can see what she's talking about. And we did, we got to that point where with these tantrums, it was like, this is not normal. This is not, like, I can't express to you <laughs> how long these would go on. And it would just be, you would think he's going to exhaust himself. And he would not. It was to the point where you wouldn't go out in public. No, you wouldn't, you we wouldn't, wouldn't go you, anywhere. You cringe going to family functions because you, you didn't know what what you were going to get. And, and then, like... Kate said, hindsight, looking back, you know, you, you could go, well, what, now that we know he has a diagnosis, what, what is condition, what is him being a four-year-old, and what is 
you know, so you had to navigate the, as far as a disciplinary thing, you couldn't, well, I can't discipline him for something that's out of his control because he, he can bite you and then you go, why'd you bite me? And he'll look at you like, I didn't bite you because that part is gone. It just is gone. It's not there. So he doesn't know why he's getting in trouble for something that just happened. So it's really difficult to navigate then, that part. Of it. And then making anybody in your family believe that. Right. Like, you just need to spank him. You just need to do this. You just need to do that. We had done everything. And then it's like you find, well, we're being completely inconsistent with him because we're trying all these different parenting and disciplinary tactics and and nothing's working. So we did. We went to Willamette ASD. He had this evaluation, and he ended up being deficit in... Four, three or four different areas of development, one primarily being the speech. But there were other things that it's to this day, it is still amazing to me that occupational therapy, all they do is play with a kid and they can see things like that that's missing. Like you throw them a ball, did they reach up with both hands and grab it? No, they're grabbing with one or the other, or they're trying to grab with this one, and this one's a lot slower to grab it. And two, it was maddening to me because I'm like, there's all these people that know these things about kids' development, and I'm their parent, and I don't know any of it. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. And when all these rages and fits were happening, it was, you know, I do remember at one point praying, like, there's got to be something better. There's got to be something better. But I can't say I really put a lot of effort into that prayer. Um, like he said, we were to the point where like we wouldn't come to church. We wouldn't come, we wouldn't go to anything <laughs> um, to but, avoid Or, or one, stuff would, like that one would stay home and the other, the yeah. rest of the kids would go with a parent. Right. And uh, yeah. and and then you would you would you would get that way where oh let's, everything's kind of going fine. Well let's go. And then the minute you hit a door or you hit a a store or something, it, it, it's like a light switch would just go on and it would be a, I remember taking Grayson completely out of Safeway and he was screaming so bad and it, it went on for 45 minutes and you just kind of tune out the world and you just go and you know, you left your cart, you left everything there behind and, and he's, he's fighting you for all he's worth and you know. Of course, he was smaller then, so you could just pick him up and take him out. But now you can't do that. When yeah. he's, you know, so it's, yeah, and then, you know, so, and then on Kate's side of it, she would go, oh, well, what are they going to think? They're going to they're gonna call and come take our kid away from me because we're being this bad parent to our kids, you know, because his reaction is, ow, even though you just, like, maybe touched his hand. And that's, you know, so his reaction is that, and, you know, what the world sees and what you see Oh yeah, you have like all this like, stuff swirling through your head. You know, like somebody's gonna think something, call CSD, and and we finally with Willamette ASD, he qualified thankfully for free services because he had so many deficits, right. and that was a huge blessing for us. And there was a preschool down here, early intervention preschool at the Methodist Church. And so they got him all signed up for that. We met the teacher who she had been teaching, doing this with special needs kids for like 20 years. And we talked with her a lot about the whole situation. And we were like, oh, by the way, if this happens to happen, every once in a while, he's got these weird episodes where he gets a fever and he throws up and it comes on really quick. We're like, we don't know. His lips turn blue. We're like, we don't really know what's happening. Yeah, his, he gets all dusky and ashy, and his lips would turn blue and scare us to death. But the doctor's like, it's just his larynx doing its job. It's keeping food out of his lungs, et cetera, et cetera. And as we're telling her all this, she looks at us, and she goes, he's having a seizure. Just, just like that. And I was like, what? She goes, that, that, was, is, that was the teacher. The teacher. At the moment that he is yeah. She goes, I've been doing this forever. She said, that is a seizure. And she gave us this name and phone number of this doctor. And she said, he's a pediatrician. He specializes in kids with behavioral issues. 
because at that time we were also struggling with Noah being very, very hyperactive and at home it wasn't an issue for us ever. But at school there were a lot of social and well and just issues with teachers arising. Um, so she said, take Noah to see this doctor, ask him if he'll see Grayson. Um, and we did that. And that was like the beacon of light from God for us. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, I mean, we've gone a couple of years now where I'm getting scratched and bitten and hit and kicked. And like, I'm like black and blue on my arms. And it was horrible. Absolutely horrible. And our first visit with the doctor, and it doesn't seem like a sign from God, but it was that in our first appointment, Grayson had one of these episodes. Yeah, and and it just scared the doctor a lot. It freaked him out. And he said, there's either something wrong with his heart or he's having a seizure. He said, it's one of the two. So then that triggered all this testing that we started doing. He had, a sleep study done, he had an EKG done, he had, um, did he have, an, he did not have an MRI done at that point. He, no, had, he, had, he had the, the EKG. 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 Yeah, done it. And, and he didn't even get through like 10 minutes of that because you're supposed to sleep deprive him and everything. Well, we had to take Abe out of school and Kate was there. So too many people are in the room, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't finally sleep. But they had enough in that like 10 minutes they're like, nope. And by the time we got home, we had a call from OSU. OHSU. OSU, OSU yeah. And said, yeah, you need to come see this neurologist. So we were like, okay. So so we went to up to Portland to see this pediatric neurologist. And he had, he had, he had a seizure in his office right in front of him. And, and he had like... Well, and I've read how people have gone years and they can't demonstrate what's happening with right. their child. So, so it's just parents reporting it and the doctor said this is so great that this happened here so I can see what is happening because you know, he's like a professor up there who teaches classes <laughs> so it's like to see one right live in front of you and they're like oh okay and then he had he had nine more that day on the way home yeah. nine, nine more yeah. and they were all like 30 seconds 15 seconds some were up to almost two minutes and well, and you have to think too, like all of this is happening over a span of years, all these little moments, like him and I driving in the car, going to see my cousin and he throws up in the, his car seat and he'd done that a lot off and on. And I was like, what is the deal? Like every time we're in the car, you're throwing up. And as an infant, he had had acid reflux. So I assumed it was something still with a reflux thing happening with his stomach. But in hindsight, it's no, he's having all these little mini seizures. And the doctor wanted to do like genetic testing, the, the neurologist, he wanted to do genetic testing and um, have him do an MRI. He said, MRI is a standard to see. He said, often we can't really determine what's happening. So we went and did this MRI a few weeks later. And in between all this time, I'm still working like 60 hours a week. It's just craziness. And I had thought, ever since Ava had been born, I played around with the idea of opening a daycare. And just to be home, you know, you wanna be home with your kids when they're little. And, but this was like the turning point for that, where it's like, okay, I really need to start looking at something else because work was not forgiving. They were, we cannot drop you down to part-time, there's nothing we can do. And it was like, we were having these random appointments places and, it's like, I have to find this time. I have to be able to do this. And um, so we went and did the MRI and up there at OHSU. And that is hard. You know, your kid is, you know, he was three, yeah. I think, or maybe four. And he's this little boy and he's got to have an IV placed and be put to sleep. And, and the results, I really wasn't worried about. I really didn't think anything was going to come of it. But sure enough, we were 30 minutes into our drive home and his neurologist called us and he said, I really didn't think we were going to find anything. But sure enough, he said there was a spot in his right temporal lobe. He said, it's a blurring. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, 
honestly, he said more than likely it was an area of his brain that in utero did not develop correctly. And he said, I'm guessing that's probably where the seizures are coming from. And that was really, really upsetting and hard because we, I had had a rough pregnancy. I had fractured discs in my spine. Um, I was taking narcotics for pain control, not until my third trimester, which they told me was safe, but no matter what you feel like, did that do something? And he was like, no. He said, all of this development would have happened in your first trimester. He said it had nothing to do with that, but it doesn't matter. To this day, I have a hard time with that. Right, you as a parent, you think, oh, what did I do? And in what, you know, like the, you asked about the darkness, prior to that phone call coming home, because of all the lack of sleep and the frustration and, and being two different people, we, it was putting a strain on our marriage. Yeah. And so we had just gotten an argument because he wanted McDonald's. Well, I went and took a wrong road and I'm like, she goes, well, why are you going this way? We didn't go back that way. And so we were, just, it was just getting, and then that phone call came and we got that news and it's like, why are we arguing? This is, yeah. <laughs> that's a small yeah, picture. We're, we're, we're nitpicking about the way we're taking a route somewhere. This is, you the, know? This is the, my new picture in this grand scheme of things Yeah. that this little guy in the back seat is going through and, and you just, it just, all that goes away. Yeah. And we... There is like there's a lot of moments of darkness, like those years where he was so violent, and you think, oh my gosh, is this ever gonna change? And I do. It's like to this day, I still find myself just randomly throughout the day, like I oh think God, we found his doctors, mm -hmm. and that his teacher at William and ESD knew exactly what she was talking about, and it's like God sent those people to us, and I 100% believe that. Because we were all, our whole family, Ava, no included, we were all in such a bad place. Yeah. So I want to take us back for just a moment. You and I had agreed on having this conversation mm -hmm. during Lent, right before COVID. So this was one of our first COVID ain't going to happen. As you tell the story, the two of you, you got three reactions from people. You either got poo-pooed, mm -hmm. you got judged, mm -hmm. or you had people that said incredible and wise things to you. Mm -hmm. As your community that continued to be part of your journey with you, what are the most valuable ways we can come alongside of a family, not necessarily your family, that seems to be struggling? Because poo-pooing isn't helpful, mm. and judgment isn't helpful. Mm. What are the wise or loving things when we see somebody struggling, might we say or do? I think if a family just all of a sudden seems very absent, I think it's important to reach out to them. I think it's, I remember bringing up to somebody how I had never I don't know why it bothered me because we were here at church one time and somebody was announced that they were being put on some committee. And I thought, I don't even know that person. And I, I didn't even know who they were. And I thought I've been here my whole life and I've never been asked to be on a committee. And one of the people I spoke with, they said, well, just watching you, we felt like you had enough on your plate. And I was like, isn't that for me to decide? Because you're right, I do, but maybe I need something else. So I think if a family is absent, it's important to reach out to them and find out if something's going on. It might not be anything, it might be kids' sports or whatever. But I think that's important to reach out. Um, one of the things here, there was a huge thing, and I remember saying it at a function and crying. <laughs> because it was such a big deal to me that Grace Allen and Tracy Mosier were so inclusive of our kids. <laughs> and so, like, it didn't matter how they acted to them, they were wonderful. <laughs> and they let them participate in anything and they never judged them. And I remember Noah, <laughs> during a service, walking around the sanctuary one time, like, he was so, just like, 
nothing could hold his attention. And that was during all of this. And he just like walked around and started running around. And I had to go chase him and I was so embarrassed. <laughs> and Mark Dickman goes, oh my gosh. He goes, he makes me laugh so hard. He said, but in a good way. He goes, I love him. He goes, don't do anything to change him. And that made me feel so good. It was just, I will say that here, people have been very, very inclusive of our kids and very caring about them. That has been a huge, huge thing for us. Because, I mean, even we even have family members that it has been a struggle to get older people with their older generation way of thinking <laughs> to think that, you know what, I can't spank this out of my kid. That's not going to make it better. You know, I can't. There's like there's some how I was could, raised is could, not could, gonna work. <laughs> you can control them by flipping the switch, and right, and, right, and there there isn't. Yeah. Uh, but back to your point, I you know I I agree with Kate. You know, being inclusive, uh, in but forgiving. Like more recently, Grayson had a seizure here, and uh, this Sunday school director Kate Creighton. Creighton. You know, while we were dealing with that, everybody wants to help, but they don't know how. And at that moment, we don't have time to teach how to handle him. Or So space is a good thing, giving us the, the space that, that we need to to deal with that. You know, so he did. He just like, okay, hey, let's all just move over here and just... You know, so, he just kind of redirected everything. Yeah, to so keep, the focus wasn't on us. Right. So you know, we're not distracted from them and what they're there to be learning or being, you know, because they were having a meeting. So they, that was important. Mm -hmm. But it was also important for us to have that little bit of to be able to handle it. And I remember Bree Hupp said that he's with his mom. He knows she knows what she's doing. Just leave her alone. And I so appreciated that because. We do have like I feel like some family members that are like you know they're right there and they want to help and they want and they're right here in your ear talking to and it's like I need you to go away I need you to it's like I know you're trying to be helpful and I appreciate that but I can't handle this if you're talking at me I can't do that um, and when somebody doesn't know how to handle a situation it's not helpful for them to be right there in that moment. Um, it's occurring to me too, Kate, that um, sometimes instead of advice, questions, or or even curiosity would be far more helpful. Yes, yes, yeah. You know, now after the fact, after he comes out of it, then you know we'll be happy to answer any yeah. question on that. What next time when this happens? Because sometimes we're not going to be there. Right. You know, like he could be down there right now and you know Ava might know because she's down there helping with costumes but you know uh, someone who doesn't know you know like somebody goes well does he need to lay down I'm like no because he's throwing up he'll he'll choke on that so he needs to be sitting up and sometimes when he goes in his seizures he's not responsive you, you, you could ask him his name he might he'll just look through you and uh right I was going to say, when he started having these seizures, my best answer for what it looks like, he is not, they're not seizures that like grand malls, there are focal seizures, so there are silent seizures. They're, he's staring off into space, and my best explanation is he looks dead. Because there's nothing in his eyes, there's nothing there. His face goes ashy, it's very, very disturbing looking. Um, is he going to have these the rest of his life? Probably. Really? More, yeah, they had, at one point when we had the first MRI, they thought he might grow out of them. Um, and now they they did another MRI and they're like, no, I don't think that's the case. I mean, they still throw the word surgery out there, which scares the, the Jesus out of us. Yeah. So. But we, uh, so we, we did back to where we were at um we did eventually get hooked up with a lot of great doctors his medicine does control his seizures all of these things are 
blessings for us. Mm -hmm. And we still have moments of breakthrough seizures. We, we are still navigating parenting a child with autism, which everybody, a lot of people think, and we went a lot of years with, he's not autistic, he's too social, he's too social. Well, for him, it's he wants to be social. He cannot read any of your expressions. He cannot read an inflection in your voice. You sound annoyed. He has had to learn. So for me, there's a lot of things I thought back on as a parent that I thought, you know, when I was a kid, things were just instinctual, like my mom and my dad, and she's a man, a woman, and he's a man, and that's just how they look, and that's kind of, you know, and you just knew things. Like, I don't remember anybody going, oh, here's the difference between why a boy and girl look different, or what have you. Nobody ever said that. You just learn you just knew those things and Grayson couldn't differentiate he couldn't look at you and say you look like a female he, he couldn't do any of that he had none of that and so everything he has learned everything he does socially from that aspect is very much a learned behavior he has been taught how to go up and shake somebody's hand how to speak with them working on not just interrupting in the middle of a conversation constantly. Right, and his, his um, concept of time is like, he'll say, hi, I'm Grayson, well now we're best friends. Yes. Lead into a stranger and he'll want to go to their house and mm -hmm. do their garbage cans. Or when we pull out of the driveway, he goes, well, are we in Woodburn yet? And we mm -hmm. haven't even left Robert Frost. Mm -hmm. So yeah. th that, that concept of time is, is not there either. He can read it, he can tell you, oh, it's five after 10, but to know, well, you know, church is going to start in 20 minutes. Well, when, when's church going to start? Mm -hmm. You know, well, in 20 minutes. Well, it, it, that's right now. Mm -hmm. So the, that that whole mm -hmm. aspect too also yes. hinders that social behavior. To with, you know, for him that then there becomes a frustration. Well, the only quickest out on the frustration with him is is anger, or mm -hmm. it's a trigger. It, it, they call them triggers. They, it, that's what starts a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. Now he's learning to kind of manage some of those, like we were saying earlier, you know, some would go for 45 minutes. Well, now something back then that would take 45 minutes it only takes like 45 seconds for him to come off it. So there's there's progress there, but then there are times where it, well, it's not. Like he was saying, looking back in hindsight, that extreme anger before he would throw up and have these episodes they're, I don't think I can think of the right terminology, but they're a pre-episode before his seizures. And when he does have a seizure, it's like he resets. It's like you've hit a reset button and he's this kind, loving child. And it's, so it's like there's, even though he takes medication for it, the, the way the doctor explained it is that the medication basically is a pillow around the area that's causing the seizure, but it's still happening. Um, so it's not affecting the entire rest of his brain. Um, we, a couple of years ago, we had done some more EGs because the doctor was hoping he'd gone on medication so long, like four or five years with no breakthroughs. And he was like, well, maybe he's growing out of them. Maybe he said kids can grow out of them. And he has always said that the brain can recircuit itself in amazing ways. And... But sure enough, even on his medication, they could still see all the seizure activity happening. And his last MRI, his hippocampus is much smaller than it should be and doesn't have the fluid in it that it should. So he, it explains to us a lot that the issues at school with short-term memory, that would explain that. He doesn't have his short-term memory. He's got great long-term memory. Um, but he struggles with like reading comprehension, like reading a book and then trying to explain to you what happened in that book, you know, things like that. Um, we've definitely, there's still like days here and there where things are rough, but nothing like it was then. And two, we were very much blessed with a daughter who not only did she grow up with this brother who's autistic and has epilepsy and she's 
dealt with these episodes and seen what happens. She had a friend at school, same thing. Um, his were uncontrollable, and he unfortunately passed away. Um, but she, it has made a, her a whole different kind of person. And she is very mature for her age. And she has this way of just coming along when he's having these meltdowns and just putting her arm around and she's just like, come on, buddy, super calm. The empathy that she's developed. Yes. Yeah. And she is just very, you know, she can like, if I'm getting to that point where it's like, I can't deal because I'm getting so frustrated. And she will. She'll, and I feel badly because it's like she calls herself our third parent, but it's not untrue. You know, she very much right. is phenomenal at handling. Yeah, all she of can stick in right before the two sides pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would trust her over anybody else that knows Grayson yeah. to be able to take care of him over his grandparents, over anybody, because she knows exactly firsthand how to handle situations and that has been honestly a huge blessing for us that she has that ability to just intervene and just flip the whole script on how he feels and sometimes that's all it takes so but yeah there's there's times that you know we don't come to church or we miss church and Sometimes it is leave. just because, like anybody else, you're just tired and you don't <laughs> want to move in the morning. But there are times we don't come because it's literally like it is a bad day for him and I'm not even going to try. But we have gone a lot better with things as far as getting out of the house and he's done a special needs uh, top soccer. He did that this last and he loved it. And... It was the first time they had it in Silverton, and it was great. I was he had a really good time and swimming lessons. He had swimming yeah, lessons for autistic a, and special needs, and, and that was great. Yeah, there's so many things like that that scare me because epileptics often drown. Um, he doesn't under he never understood the concept of like holding your breath. He'd go in the water and try and inhale. And that would scare us to death. And he, you know, they teach kids how to blow bubbles out of their nose and he can't blow out like the sensation. He doesn't understand that. Um, so there's things like that, like such a blessing to find this group that they got this grant in Kaiser that to do swimming lessons for special needs kids. And it's like, thank you. Like I've been looking for this for a long time yeah. and just I mean, more and more, like, in the dark moments, there were certainly times that it's like, thank God, thank God, thank God. And now I look back, and I'm, like, I'm so happy to be his parent now. I feel blessed <laughs> to be his parent because it's, it's changed me. It changes who you are and how you handle things and situations and how you look at other parents. You know, like, I was one of those people I 100% did not believe in ADHD at all <laughs> until we had Noah. And it was like, oh, this is a thing. This is an actual, legitimate, serious thing. It truly is, yeah. You know, um, yeah, it was just like discipline your kids better, you know, pay attention to them more. And I absolutely was that person, and I'm not that person at all anymore. And I can very much, like, see families now and not judge them at all. <laughs> nope. So. You mentioned being in a grocery store. Yeah. Uh, and I admit that I've seen situations occasionally where, well, why can't you control your kid? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. This kind of gives me a whole new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well but you know, but, but that's, that's the navigation part. You, you don't know because, and I'll tell every therapist or whoever we talk to, I'm like, well, what part is it him just being, because he'll get that smirk on his face, like, uh, you know, I'm going to do this. And that's the struggle <laughs> now as a parent that's you know, older. Because yeah. you know he's, he's just being a kid and they, they're, they're wanting that box of cereal that you're not going to buy him. And, and we're just being armory. And then you know, I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to run off. You know, I remember running away from my mom, you know, in this grocery store. But, I mean, I was a lot younger. And, but those things. But then it's like when he's having whatever, his switch goes off. And it's the autistic part. 
you can't, you just got to let it, have to let it play out, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's the hard part because, you, like I say, people walk by, well, hey, you know. I actually had a coworker one time when we were in there shopping, and she goes, can't you control your kid? You know, because he was oh, he yeah. was so loud. He was so yeah. loud with the whole no, store. Actually, and, no. and, you know, <laughs> turned him in the produce aisle when he was down on, on you know the milk aisle. So I'm like I'm like no, he's doing his job. And you know, it you struck know. me that and you mentioned that he the, the smirk and he, like he knows what's going. How do you navigate the difference between being a treating him as a normal kid? And treating him as a special needs kid because, like I said, well, does he give? Do we give him the box of cereal just because he's graceful? Well, and that's a struggle, and that too is still a struggle with people that are around us. So, one of the ways the autism diagnosis came about is that he had this obsession with garbage cans, like uncontrollable, and we're like. Oh my gosh! Like well, that's his, his driving poison of the day. It controls the whole aspect of it. Yeah, life. and it, it's this like he wants to move garbage cans around. He wants to put the neighbor's garbage out for them. He wants to bring them in. He wants to, which is great, but it's like all the time, and it's like we have somewhere to be. We have to eat dinner. You have to go to bed. Like it was unreal. And. After talking to the psychologist, she said the difference between OCD and autism. She said OCD, people know that their behavior isn't normal. They know that it's not typical. They try and fight it. And she said for Grayson, this is his soothing thing. This is his comfort. He, it, he gives in to and, it. And he doesn't give in to it, but it, well, it's what makes him feel better. Right. And seeing that you you really do because that was one of the triggers is if he couldn't do the garbage can thing he would have these meltdowns and i was like oh my gosh and she was like no this is what regulates him this is a self-regulation thing and i still have a family member at her house she hides her cans she's like i'm not giving in to him i'm not giving in to him letting him have his way and we just don't talk about it because i'm like that's not what it is. It's not that aspect is not about giving in to a kid having a fit. It is his comfort and what makes him feel better. And it's like the equivalent of if somebody grew up cherishing their baby blankie or their teddy bear and it was their source of comfort, you just took it away from them. It's a way of calming him. Yes. So, right, right. You know, and, yeah. you know, and see, before we knew that, that would be one of those tools, like if he was acting up and, well, oh, you're not going to do garbage cans on Tuesday. Well, that would make it worse. Yeah. And, and it wasn't until somebody told us that or told me that, that it was like, oh, wait a minute, I can't use the garbage can as a yeah. disciplinary tool. Because you're saying you're going to take away this kid's baby blanket or teddy bear. You're you taking away that, that comfort, that, that thing. So now those things are off the table, but there are other things that he likes to do, like Gates phone or whatever. Like, okay, you're gonna lose that for if you keep on this behavior part of him being a kid, not autistic. And, and, those, and those things do. And, and, and that, that yeah. works, you know. But uh, the time frame thing affects that too, not having a frame of right. A frame of reference. reference. Right, and, and he's like, oh, well, so when you'll say, well, now that he's older, I'm like, well, you're going to lose it for a week. Well, how long's a week? Yeah. <laughs> no, he doesn't. So it has to be like, and even a day, the whole concept of a, you know, like, well, you can't get back until tomorrow. Well, well how long is that going to be? You know, so or you almost like have to the break end of it. Tomorrow, the beginning of tomorrow, the, you know, like when. Right. Tomorrow. There's a whole discussion on when, when yeah. is that going to end because he knows I want to have that back. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You have gotten so smart during the whole process. Well, all right. <laughs> well, you know. Because of that time thing, you spend a lot of time, they call it like pre-teaching, where mm -hmm. you you spend a lot of time um, like, okay, we have to turn the TV off because we have to leave in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you say that you start that 15 minutes ahead of time. And then it's... And you've got to be very specific. You, know, you, you have to say, well, okay, we're going to be going to church. This is what's going to happen at church. This is what's going to happen here. Mm -hmm. You can will so you try and roadmap your your day or your event mm -hmm. so he knows. Okay, well, not 
to go off this side or that rail because you, you're trying to play out the scenarios in front of him so he knows how to handle those things.